Today we're going to be in Romans chapter 8, and um, we're going to start out our day in verse 18 of this passage and address this topic that is personal to me right now. It's worth the wait. How many of you are waiting on something right now? How many of you are waiting, waiting? Uh, maybe you're waiting for retirement. You're waiting to pay off that mortgage someday. You're waiting uh, on whatever it may be. A lot of us were waiting on the kids to go back to school. And hallelujah, parents, amen, amen. Hallelujah, the kids are back to school. Can I get an amen? Amen. amen. And all the parents are excited about that one. You finally have a little bit of room to breathe. Many of you may be homeschooled for the first time in 2020, and so you got a taste of what it's like to have the kids under your feet maybe all day long there at the house. Uh, we were doing a little bit of that homeschooling. Uh, our kids preparing to go back to the Philippines where we serve as missionaries there, sent out from right here at Fellowship Baptist Church. We were homeschooling, preparing to head back to the Philippines, which is still in lockdown. There's no in-person school. There's no in-person college. There's no in-person church allowed again right now. Uh, they're in lockdown again. And because of that lockdown, unfortunately, our paperwork to get back has also been delayed. And so we're waiting. We had tickets for July 31st, then we had tickets again for September 18th. And of course, all those have fallen through, those dates, uh, because we're still waiting on documents to be able to apply for our visas, which is another three-week process. And so we wait. We try to patiently wait. And God's been speaking to me about this. He's been trying to teach me through my Bible reading, and it's amazing that God knows what we need to see in the Word. And it's amazing how as we look through scriptures, I was reading in Psalm 126 about they that sow in tears shall reap in joy. They that sow in tears. I come from farm country here in Ohio. I grew up over in Ashland County or up in Ashland County, and that's all cornfields and soybeans surrounding where we live there. And I, I grew up helping my grandfather bale hay and, and learning all about farming, and my father's a mechanic. And so I know what it's like to wait. I know what the, the process of sowing and reaping is like, and we're called on through our waiting to keep sowing through our weeping, to keep on planting, to keep on pushing ahead with faith in God because the Bible promises a joyful harvest to come. You see, we wait on what we're hoping for. Uh, we wait on what we're excited about for those returns. You know, we, we don't wait very well in the drive through We don't wait very well at the microwave. But isn't it interesting how we do wait really well when it comes to investments, uh, when it comes to retirement, when it comes to paying off that mortgage. Some of us have been making payments for maybe 20 or 30 years into our mortgage, and we are waiting for that final payment day, when, when finally, maybe at that 30-year mark, you would pay off your home mortgage. Isn't it amazing how long we will wait when there's a great reward to come? We've been singing today, praising our great God. We sang some beautiful songs of worship, exalting God, praising God for the Christian as we wait. We're waiting on Him, on that God that, that is faithful, that does come through, is glorious, is sovereign, is almighty God. Isn't it sad that we put our expectancy in such lesser things with greater expectations than we have in Almighty God. God's been teaching me some things, and I just wanted to share them with you today. Sometimes those are the best sermons. I've been so blessed by Pastor Tony's sermons these past few weeks as he's preached and talked about prayer and asking and seeking and prayer and fasting and all these things that God has been teaching him through this time, their trial with Logan and, and what their family's going through. God's been teaching me about waiting, and maybe today this will help you as well. Let's look here at verse 18 of Romans chapter 8, another one of my favorite Bible passages where God showed up and I believe showed me some truth here that I want to just pass on to you. It says in verse 18, this is a more well-known verse, for I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory of which shall be revealed in us. We sang just earlier. We sang just earlier about how amazing heaven's going to be. 
Uh, when we all get to heaven, we sing these songs and we, we set our eyes to heaven so quickly when it comes to singing, to Sunday morning. But man, is it not so easy to get right back into our pessimism and our negative thinking and just this bleak outlook when it comes to Monday morning. All you have to do is turn this on. All you have to do is start scrolling through Facebook. And isn't it funny that Facebook algorithm knows you? <laughs> it knows what you like to stop on. And it's going to feed you more of that stuff. The Facebook algorithm showed me some presidential speeches this week, amen, that a lot of you weren't so excited about. The Facebook algorithm showed me some things about Afghanistan, it showed me some things about the Philippines, and it was all negative, negative. We're faced with this present reality that we're in. First of all, I want to I bring our attention to the, what the Bible shows us, first of all, about our present waiting. What is this reality we're waiting in right now? And it's amazing how the Bible not only turns our eyes to the present suffering, but to the future hope. The Bible does not let us face our present suffering without showing us the glory of heaven. Not our present pain without seeing the hope of heaven. It says in verse 19, for the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth, waiteth. For the manifestation of the sons of God. For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who has subject to the same in hope. Because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. There's a better day coming, and the Bible tells us here, don't get so focused on the present. That's not what life is all about. We're not home yet, hello? We're not home yet. We have not gotten home. We have a Savior waiting on us. He said, I'm going to prepare a place for you. It's easy to sing. I've got a mansion on the hilltop and then go out into the work week and live life as if this is all there is. Shame on us for living that way. I'm guilty as well. Looking at circumstance, doing all that I can do, pushing forward. We take these scriptures like I press toward the mark and we act like that it's all up to us. It's not up to you. You're in God's hands. You shouldn't even be here right now, right? If it weren't for the mercies of God, I should already be in hell. I should already be under punishment. I don't deserve salvation. I don't deserve a family. I've got four kids and a wife. I don't deserve a home or a roof over my head. I deserve God's judgment. I've been given so much grace and mercy here on this earth. And isn't it amazing to think that is just a small taste of what we're going to experience in heaven. Amen. We're not home yet. There is a glory to be revealed, Amen. as we point out, uh, in us and through us. We see our present waiting. I wanted to point out, first of all, what the passage says. This is through the suffering of the present time. That's there in verse 18. But as, you, as it turns it around to the positive, our second point or letter B in the outline is for the glory to be revealed in us. And to us, heaven will be a personal place. It will be personal to you and me. We will not only see and experience God's perfect creation and environment, but we will be changed into a perfect body. I'm not only going to experience the, the gates of pearl, the streets of gold, but I'm going to be in a perfected state. Can you imagine what that's going to be like? You know, no more waking up on the wrong side of the bed. Uh, no more waking up with that back pain that you, you go to the chiropractor every week or every month for. No more waking up with headaches and all these different things that we struggle with, the health concerns we have. No more doubt. No more anxiety. No more depression. No more disappointment. Only hope and expectation about what we see before our eyes as we stand in the presence of God. 1 Corinthians 15, 54 through 58, the last part of that tells us our labor is not in vain in the Lord, but it gives us the reason why it's not in vain. The reason you can keep on living right now and keep on serving, keep on hoping, keep on waiting is because of hope in the future. It says, so when 
this corruptible shall have put on incorruption and this mortal shall have put on immortality. It's talking about me and you going from mortal to immortal. From, from, from a life that, that will one day end here on earth to a, an, an eternity, an everlasting life together with God. This mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. He is our hope. That's what we have. He's our hope. Therefore, or because of that, verse 58 says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Don't quit. Why? Your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Why? Because heaven's coming. Because Jesus wins. Jesus has the victory over sin and death in this present sinful world. Our present waiting is through these sufferings. It's, it's for the glory to be revealed But it's also in the bondage of this corruption. Verses 21 and 22 point this out as it it cites this state that we're living in, in in a corrupted world, in a cursed world where we ourselves, it says, are groaning for this deliverance. Look at what it says here in verse 21. Because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God For we know that the whole creation, that's all of God's creation. We talked about all uh, the man that prayed up here after the worship said that that, that all of creation is, is glorifying God. But all of creation is also waiting for this redemption. When God will come back, when Jesus will come back to set everything in order, to make everything right, We all wait. We all wait for redemption. We all wait for perfection. When the lion will lay down with the lamb, when heaven will come to earth, when Jesus will rule and reign right here, that's what we're waiting for. We're not just waiting through pain. We're not just waiting through these present conditions. We're not just waiting in this bondage of corruption. But lastly, as we look at this, we're we're being, we're waiting to be delivered, as verse 21 says, to glorious liberty, glorious freedom, freedom beyond belief. Can you imagine freedom from pain, freedom from suffering, freedom from this earth, freedom from everything that we struggle with, freedom from broken relationships and broken lives and hurting people. No one will be hurting up there anymore. We won't hurt each other anymore. Aren't we good at that? They say hurt people, hurt people won't be doing that anymore in heaven. We'll have perfect unity, perfect compassion for each other. It will be glorious freedom. We're waiting on that. So may God change our perspective about our present waiting that we're not home yet. There's a better day coming. May God help us to not just sing about it, but actually believe it. It's convicting to me. I've been in church since I was in diapers. Actually, I meet people randomly. Isn't that awkward, Pastor Dave, when you meet someone and says, I had you in the nursery, you know? I'm like, Lord, forgive me for what I put them through in the nursery. <laughs> you know, those are, great, those are great saints of God, those people that have been faithful 40, 50 years. I think about those people and their faithfulness to God. And I think of how sometimes fickle I am, you know, and how we, we as modern day American Christians in 2021, it seems like we have the world at our fingertips, don't we? We have everything we need. We can go to the store, better yet, just get on Amazon. I was in Best Buy the other day, the place was barren. I waited 15 minutes to find a worker. I thought, isn't this, isn't this the world that we're living in right now? Everybody's at home, click, okay. In one day, you've got it at your house, or two days, you can have it there. We live in an instant world where we don't wait on anything. 
Man, as we looked at that older generation, those people who just faithfully shared the gospel, that mom and dad who faithfully every Sunday had you in church, uh, that, that continual faithfulness over time that built great churches like Fellowship Baptist Church, we live in a great debt of gratitude to men and women of God who live like that. They waited through through world wars. They waded through pandemics and disease. They waded through uh, disease or, or diagnosis that they had. They didn't even know what it was. You know, imagine back then the lack of science and what we have right now in modern, modern medicine. We don't have to wait. We, we get instant results, an instant pill to fix this or that, an instant therapy that should probably work. We have a lot to learn when it comes to waiting. God teaches us some lessons on waiting and how we're to do this. We can see here, secondly, not only our present waiting, but God's plan for our waiting. In verses 22 through 26, we see this outlined really clearly. I want you to zone in with me on our passage today, and let's look at how the Bible teaches us to wait. Look at verse 23, and not only they, not only the creation, not only the world around us is waiting, but ourselves also which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves grown within ourselves waiting. Again, there's that word, waiting for the adoption to wit, the redemption of our body. For we are saved by hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. That verse really gripped me this week. For what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for? Or why do you hope for what you see? And in fact, we don't. The Bible is giving us a question that we know the answer to. But if we hope for that we see not, then do we, with patience, wait for it. We wait a whole lot better. We learn a whole lot more patience when we can't see. That's the secret here. If I can see it, if I can control it, if I can manipulate it, if I don't have to wait for it, I'll just jump right back into doing what I do without God. Are you guilty with me? If I don't have to wait, if I can just see an exit or see a detour that'll get me back where I want to be, I will run toward that thing, no matter what it takes. I'm a fixer. Is any fixers in here with me today? Are you a fixer? Oh, yeah. Yeah. We have issues, right? We have issues. We try to fix everybody else's problems and we usually can't even fix our own. It brings us to the point where we know we need him. We don't have it. We don't, we don't got it. Excuse my bad grammar. We don't have what it takes to get where we want to go or where we even should be. The Bible teaches us here about hope And it reminds us in verse 24 of what we've seen. It says, for we are saved by hope. This is the the evidence of salvation, the things that we've experienced in our own personal lives. We've we've seen our own salvation. We've been saved. We've seen the evidences of that in our lives. We've seen God save others and how he works in their lives and restores broken homes and broken lives and broken families. We know what God can do. And so the Bible's saying, that's not really hope at all. That's just seen. That's, that's the substance and evidence that Hebrews talks about that we have as Christians. We don't need to hope for a sign or, or wish God would show, him to, show himself to us. Just look around at the people in the lives that have been changed. Look around at the people that God has healed. You say, I don't know if God does that anymore. Yes, he does. Yes, he does. My grandfather in 1985, the year that I was born, was diagnosed with cancer, stage four, six months to live. And because of prayer warriors like you guys in this church that are praying for Logan, because of that, my grandfather got 20 more years of life from God. He met my wife, Mindy. He gave us his blessing, so to speak. And and we live, I, I largely live in the light of that kind of testimony. My grandpa was a faithful man, served as a deacon in our church, and I got to see the Christian life lived out because of him. God gave him more time. We've seen this. We know what God can do. We've seen him build great churches across America. We've seen the gospel light go into all nations. We see the church in China, 300 million people, almost the population of America. It's booming. It's growing without all of this, without all of this. 
underground, in homes, in restaurants, in office buildings, baptizing in bathtubs and rivers, wherever they can, the church is marching on. Jesus said, the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And they haven't, they never will. We have hope. And have we not seen so much? But may we be challenged today to believe in what we haven't seen. This is where faith comes in. You see, I thought faith was not just a shot in the dark. Well, thank God it's not all that way. (laughs) Actually, most of it in the Christian life is very obvious, especially, as we'll talk about in a minute, when the Holy Spirit gets involved. It's obvious what God's doing. We just talked about it. But isn't it hard when we've never seen God do something like we're expecting or hoping he will do? Haven't seen it. In fact, as we talk about heaven I'm pretty sure none of you have ever been there yet, right? Okay. You know, we we hear these stories, heaven is for real, and five seconds in hell, or all these different books or things that people have written, but the truth is, we haven't been there. We haven't been there. We haven't seen it yet. Uh, we're, we're, We're anticipating, and the Bible says here, there's a secret in that kind of hope, that kind of faith. Verse 25, but if we hope, For that we see not. If you hope in what you haven't seen, what happens, then do we with patience wait for it. The secret to biblical waiting and learning to wait is in the times when I can't see it. When I can't really see the outcome, I don't even know or can't even uh, consider what could happen. I don't know the timeline. I don't know the way. I don't know the means and I don't know the outcome. I just have to trust. I have to keep moving ahead like we said about that sower in Psalm 126, just sowing, weeping, sowing, and weeping, waiting, and weeping, and sowing, knowing that a joyful harvest is coming. Knowing, as Romans 8, 28 will follow up this, and we know, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. Say, who's that? That's you. (laughs) Them who love God, them that are called according to his purpose, that's all of you. No one doesn't have a calling or a purpose on their life. That's all of us. Why does it say, and we know? Why does it remind us that we know? Because we have trouble waiting. We have trouble waiting. We're not living in a glorified body. We're not living in a glorified state. We're not home yet. And God's plan for our waiting is to find hope even in the unseen. Even when I can't see it, secondly, we see that his plan for our waiting is to learn patience as mentioned here in verse 25. Are you patient when you can see it? Are you patient when you can manipulate it? Are you patient when you have a way? I've got a way, Pastor. (laughs) i got a plan. Much better, God's got a plan. You get to wait, and you get to learn patience. That's the beauty of, of God's plan through waiting. What are you waiting for today? Maybe waiting on that marriage to come back together. You've been doing everything you can trying to serve that other person, trying to get back to those old days of when you were dating and whatever you can do just to keep that love alive. Maybe you're emailing, maybe you're texting, calling that son or daughter who your relationship is broken with and it's a dead end street. Maybe you say, I've never seen a family as messed up as mine. (laughs) That's no big deal to God. I don't know what you're waiting on today, Maybe you're like Pastor Tony and Jenny waiting on healing for a diagnosis they don't even really have yet. They don't know what type of cancer this is. There's no name for it yet. The next few weeks, Pastor Tony said, are just kind of weighing out or trying to search more. What is this before they do a surgery? That's waiting when you can't see And that's teaching us all in those moments, patience. 
The greatest thing God does for us in his plan for our waiting is that we learn or we start to rely on the help of the Holy Spirit. It's here in our passage, likewise, verse 26, the Spirit also helpeth. Amen to that, right? The Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, our sufferings, our issues, this present life that we face. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. I wrote down three ways the Holy Spirit helps me and you. He's helping in our infirmities, he's helping in our inability, and he's helping for our intercession. I've got issues, so do you. I've got things I can't fix without God's help. I've got relationships, I've got uh, uh, future things I don't know what to do about. And I'm unable, like you often, to even pray as I ought to pray. I don't even know what to say. You ever get to that point? God, hey, it's me again. (laughs) I surrender, as we sang earlier, or what we'll sing in here in a minute. I surrender. I, I don't know what to do, but I know that you do. And I trust you. I'm going to keep serving. I'm going to keep waiting. I'm going to keep praying. I'm going to keep loving my family and my church. I'm going to stay faithful. I'm not going to get bitter at you. I trust you. The Holy Spirit helps us in these times. We don't even know what to pray or what to say. We don't know what to pray for. But the beauty of this is, the, whole, the, the passage tells us here that The Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. To sum this up in common English today, he's praying prayers for you you could never pray for yourself. He's speaking to God in a way according to the will of God that you have no idea about. In fact, if you knew a glimpse of all God was doing, you'd probably be terrified, and that's why God doesn't let you know. If I would have known eight years ago or nine years ago that I was going to be in the Philippines and that I would have went through the majority of the pandemic with my family in the Philippines, I'd be like, no way, no way, take me off that list. But thank God I was there. Thank God we're here now in the States, and thank God for what he's taught me in those waiting times. The biggest growing season of my life was during the pandemic. It's been during those days of lockdown in the Philippines. It's been those those days of those Zoom chats and life groups and services that we were forced into having at times where our church family in the Philippines grew closer together than they've ever been before. Imagine that we actually had to talk to each other (laughs) during church. We just didn't beeline for the exit doors and get to the restaurants, but we actually fellowshiped with each other. We were forced to, when you're staring at a Zoom, you know what I'm talking about. You're like, somebody's got to say something. This is weird. So we actually talk. May God help us to rely on the help of the Holy Spirit in our infirmities and our inability and for this intercession that only he can give. Only he can bring this. Jesus told Peter, I've prayed for you. I've prayed for you. Isn't it amazing to think that through all that God is doing in the world and through everything God has going on, that he takes time for me? The Holy Spirit in me, God in the Spirit, third person of the Trinity, living in me, with me everywhere I go, with you everywhere you go, omnipresent, always available, always listening, always hearing your heart's cry and then translating that back to God in a way that no one could ever comprehend or imagine. Your intercessor, your go-between, your advocate. It says here in verse 27, he that searcheth the heart knoweth what is the mind of the spirit because he maketh intercession for the saints according to to the will of God. The wonderful promise, number three, in this waiting, God's promise in this waiting is that we would see his wisdom through his will being done. The prayer of Jesus Christ himself was not my will, but what was it? Thine be done. If Jesus had to pray that on earth, 
shouldn't that mean that I got to pray that every day? I've got to have that in my mind and heart all the time. God, I don't know your will. I don't know all of your ways. I think that sometimes I do, but I don't have a clue. God, do what only you can do. Restore like only you can restore. Heal like you can only heal. God, do it your way, not my way. You'll always mess things up. He never will. You're going to make wrong moves and wrong calls. You young people, you think you might have it all figured out. Once you're in your 30s like me, you'll figure out you know nothing. (laughs) You need to rely on these older gray heads because they know a whole lot more than we do. We see God's wisdom through his will. We get to know, know his working is for good. It says in verse 28, and we know, we know. (laughs) I love that. We know. All things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose for whom he did foreknow. He also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. And we know, the next verse says, and whom he did foreknow. The beauty of that is, is that God knows you. He's always known you. As David said, before I was even in my mother's womb, you knew me. When I was there, you knew me. Uh, God's always known you. You've been on his heart and mind from eternity past and will be into eternity future. He loves you, the Bible says, with an everlasting love. No one could know you more. No one could desire more for you. Today, if you don't know Christ as Savior and friend, I would invite you to the greatest relationship the world has ever known. The greatest love uh, expression that Jesus gave when he put himself willingly on the cross, when he willingly laid down his life, the Bible says, for his friends. Those were wicked people. Those were sinners. Those were vile people standing at that foot of the cross. They were, they were jeering at him. They were cursing at him. They hated him for his message. After he rose again, they did everything they could the Romans did, to twist the message and to make it seem (laughs) that he really didn't. They tried to chain that tomb down, tie it down, guard it, whatever they had to do, but they could not prevail. Today, if you do not know Christ, he's already won the victory. He's already won. We are just simply called to put our faith and trust in him. Victory over sin, victory over this present world with all of its pain, all of its issues, and put our faith in something beyond this world, beyond our effort. I can't, I can't save myself. I can't, I can't do enough. But to put my faith and trust in Christ alone, through faith alone, by his grace alone. His grace alone is what saves me and seals me and redeems me from this whole world of sin. Do you know the Savior. He knows you. He knows you and he's calling you by name today to trust him by faith for your salvation. To turn, as Pastor Dave said earlier, in repentance. Repentance just means a a change of mind that leads to a change in action. You're going to have to change your mind about God today and say, you know, he's not just the guy in the sky. He's not the old man upstairs. This is a God intricately involved in my life and wants to know me. He wants to know me so much that he sent his son to live and to die so that you could put your faith in him, the resurrected Savior, Jesus Christ. Today, it's not only a call for unbelievers to start believing, but for us as believers to start waiting better, to start serving better, to start being more patient, to, to see his wisdom through his will being done, to know his working is for our good and ultimately, as this passage points out so clearly to us, to become more like Jesus. Verse 29 says, for whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son. You want to be more like Jesus? Learn to wait. 
Learn to wait. Learn to wait patiently, expectantly, hoping for what God will do. Our hope is not just in the unseen. Our hope is in also what we have seen. We've seen so much so we can trust God for the unseen. We can trust God for what we're patiently waiting for, patiently waiting through and saying, God, you've been faithful. You've provided everything I've needed to this point. You've been there for me. I trust you.